Okay, welcome back to another vid. The Friday brew. Got my brew, obviously, with hashtag gifted arrogant. Hashtag arrogance on the uh, on the front there. Now I didn't buy it for myself. That would be a little bit big headed. But someone got it for me at work. This is probably about two or three years ago. And she didn't just get it for me, that would be weird. Uh, plus the wife would be furious. But she got a number of presents for like everyone on our team. Just little things like obviously the mug. And I think someone else got like a stuffed toy. And then someone else got something Star Wars related because they're really into that. Uh, I mean, I am a little bit, but not as much as I used to be. And uh, But I remember opening it up and because I didn't know what it was, of course. And, and I was uh, appreciative, clearly. Uh, but I wondered to myself, why is she giving me a mug that says hashtag gifted? Does she think I'm gifted or does she, and this is probably more likely, does she think I'm like cocky, um, which is right. And, and therefore I would like that. And maybe she thought it would be something I'd buy for myself. In which case, that's kind of like sort of a backhanded compliment, isn't it? Wasn't sure how to take that. So I felt a bit like kind of weird, even though, like I said, I was very thankful when she gave it to me. Inside my head, I was like, a bit cheeky. Or, do, or does she think I'm that arrogant, like I say? Who knows? And then I felt extra paranoid when people would come to my desk and on it they'd see, amongst everything else, a mug that, like I say, shows hashtag gifted. And I thought that they'd be coming to my desk, they probably didn't, it's just all in this mental head, but I thought they'd be coming to my desk, seeing that mug and thinking, he's, he loves himself. But I didn't buy it, someone gave it to me for a present, so what, what can you do? It's one of those things. So, um, but yeah, but obviously it clearly was a problem because uh, I brought it home from work and now it's at uh, a mouse, clearly. So there we are, completely unnecessary little uh, story to begin with about a mug. You weren't expecting that one, were you? So, yeah, uh, I know what you're thinking. How is the diet stroke healthy eating going, Alex? Well, no need to ask. I'll tell you. It's going rubbish. Of course it is. But here's the thing. In hindsight, what a ridiculous thing to even say a week before Thanksgiving, because we've just had it, of course, and a month before Christmas, even less than a month ago before Christmas now, of course. And, yeah, what a stupid idea. So 1st of January, the 1st of January, uh, January 2019, I will, I'm not going to say a diet because it's not going to happen. I'm going to go on a bit of a healthy eating kick and um, have the occasional treat, moderation. I think everything's good in moderation, isn't it? Uh, for me, moderation's a bit of a problem. Though. I can't really do it, but I'm really going to try. The thing is, once I get into a routine, it is easy. It's just that I fall off the wagon. And once I fall off the wagon, I find it really difficult to go back. It's just being committed, I think. That's all it is, isn't it? So. We'll have to wait and see. I'm not even going to bother saying, oh, I'm going to join a gym. That's what everyone does. It's a load of nonsense. I'm not going to. I can't be bothered. I've got an exercise bike, which I bought probably last year or earlier this one. I can't quite remember. I've used it a little bit. And again, once I start getting into a routine, I enjoy it. And uh, it, it, But it's just sticking to it. And it's very, very difficult. But yeah, so we had Thanksgiving, which was not last week, but the week before. Now, if you're not aware, I need a sip already. Dry throat. Plus it's getting to that time of the year where you start to feel, you know, in your throat a little bit of a sort of a, a dry throat, a bit of a cold kind of thing. Um, I'm hoping to nip it in the bud so it doesn't quite register, but it will within a few weeks because it's that time, like I say. But for anyone who's not aware, many of you probably will be, but I know there'll be some of you who don't know this. So it's just, you know, a bit of um, you know, a bit of a fact, which I'll throw you away. This may come up in a quiz in the UK, and if it does, you'll remember this, hopefully. Uh, it's not a really important one, but I'll tell you anyway. So Thanksgiving, like I say, it came, it went. Now, Thanksgiving is the fourth Thursday in November. Not the last Thursday, although sometimes it is, depending on how the calendar works. But it's the fourth Thursday. This uh, November, November just gone, had, uh, how many did it have? Five. So I think the fifth one was the 29th. But Thanksgiving was the one before. So it's the fourth Thursday in every November. And it's basically, again, for any Brit watching, although, again, I'm sure you're familiar, it's just like a big family get-together. That's all it is. Uh, a lot of people will travel, you know, cross-country if they can. <coughs> Excuse me. And, um, and and if not, well, obviously, maybe they'll just save it for Christmas or whatever. But it's, it's a big deal to a lot of Americans. For some people, they put it above Christmas, although most people I've met uh, have it the other way around. Christmas is the number one. But Thanksgiving is a really big deal. And so we just did the usual. We had family come round, which we've always had since I've been here. This is my 10th Thanksgiving, can you believe? 10 years, Jesus. And um, yeah, so same people came round really. 
and we were going to have more but because of many people have they're all kind of from California, but they've moved to different states. Obviously, like people move, don't they, around the world, and uh, in different countries, different states, cities, counties, all the rest of it. So we had a few people here, and we just, you know, we had the turkey and we had the roast and the vegetables and the, the puddings, desserts, and all that kind of thing. And again, I need another sip. Sorry about this. <coughs> I should really have waited until I've got rid of this pesky little uh, sore throat. But yeah, so it was good. And uh, we watched a little bit of TV, or at least it was on in the background. You're basically spending all night talking and, uh, like, you know, you know what it's like. It's just like a get-together. But over here as well, what you tend to find is that the next day... Some people do it before, of course, but the day after Thanksgiving, usually for a lot of people, it signifies the start of the festive period, really. So a lot of people start to put their Christmas decorations up, their trees, their lights outside. Even though this year, as I say, it was the fourth uh, Thursday in November, well, it always is, uh, but there was still a week to go of November. But people, irrespective, were putting their decorations up. That's way too early. Way too early. I put a tweet the other day. I'll, I'll put it up on the screen. And it said something along the lines of, if you, and this was like maybe a couple of days. No, this was on the 1st of December. So it was like last week. And I said, uh, happy 1st December, you know, happy Christmas, all that kind of stuff. Uh, you may officially put your decorations up. If you've already got them up and had them up for a week or something like that, then take them down and put them back up again as punishment. Because there's so many people who put them up way too early. I think there's kind of a question later on uh, about that. And I know someone else on Twitter, Nat, uh, Natalie, if you're watching, uh, she said that she put her decorations up on the 1st of November. What's all that about? That's mental. I mean, that's, I don't know why. That's, Natalie, seriously, it's disgraceful. Um, that's, that's, that's early in anyone's book, apart from yours, clearly. But, um... But yeah, so there's a lot of the neighbours have got their trees up. The ones directly opposite, obviously, you, you can't see from this angle. They've got their lights up. Um, it's, it's too light outside. But once it gets dark, and of course it gets dark early these days, because uh, of the winter months, uh, it, it, it lights the whole bloody street up, really. It's like being at a bloody um, Blackpool illumination. It's crazy. And there's another house just up the road. In fact, the one literally next door has got a lot of decorations on their front um, lawn and all that kind of stuff. And I'm not complaining. Listen... I mean, I do like a good whinge, don't get me wrong, but I do love Christmas. It's my favourite time of the year. It always has been since I was a kid. I absolutely love it. And despite being in California, you know, it can get a bit cold in the winter months. So it's not like it's boiling hot or any of those kind of cliches or anything. That's sort of LA territory. And California's a big state, like I say. Um, but yeah, so I love it. I'm really looking forward to it. And... Um, that was that Thanksgiving, so it was really good. We enjoyed it, and another year it just it just flies. It's ridiculous. So that is that. Now moving on to what I've been watching recently. In fact, if I just grab it, and can you see it? You can. Okay, good. So before I talk about this, what I'm going to start doing when it comes to summing these kind of movies and TV shows, uh, summing them up that I've been watching, I am not going to do a repeat performance, or at least I don't plan on doing it. From what I did with um, Demolition Man where I talked about it for 20 minutes and the turtles 20 minutes or whatever it was. And especially with Demolition Man, it was like I started the vid uh, or that segment of the vid that what I'm currently watching or what I have been watching. And I said, right, oh yeah, I really enjoyed it. And it starts off with this. And I'm telling you the plot. I'm telling you everything about it. And it's pointless. Not just is it making these vids longer and I want them to be shorter, but if you've already seen it, then, well, you don't need me to tell you what happens again because you've seen it. And if you haven't seen it, well, then I'm ruining the story for you. So I think what would really best suffice is if I just kind of hold it up, talk about it for a, a minute or two, but maybe more than anything, just tell you whether I liked it or not without really going into the, the, the detail and small intricacies of the plot. It's not necessary. So with that said, um, let's just try and keep this one brief. So I've been watching, I think this was last week, Maybe a little bit before. I think it was last week. Uh, Solo, a Star Wars story to give it its full title. So yeah, this came out earlier this year, I think, didn't it? And as ever on social media, you know, a lot of people really like it. A lot of people really hate it. And some people in the middle. You can never please everyone. You know, social media is one of those places these days where it doesn't matter what you say. You could have someone put a tweet out and they could say, I want to see an end to famine. And I also, I also want to see an end to you know, wars, and there will be someone who will reply and be like, well, I like wars, What? and they'll be genuine, because they're weird. So there's always going to be someone who likes to argue, 
But um, And Star Wars, it seems, has got that kind of reputation these days. Now, they don't help themselves because Disney obviously likes to whack these movies out. We're seeing one a year, and that was my one big worry once Disney got hold of this franchise. I thought they're going to do this all the time. They're going to release a movie every year, and as a result of that quick turnaround, the quality's probably going to suffer. And it kind of has to a small degree. We had The Force Awakens, we had Rogue One, we've obviously had Solo. Uh, there's another one that I've missed out. There might be another one, I'm not sh uh, sure. But they're all being whacked out year after year. And But in my opinion, all the other ones, and I think I've talked about them all on previous brews this year, I've liked them all. There have been faults, don't get me wrong, there have been some big kind of plot holes and things I didn't like whatsoever. But generally speaking, I've walked away from watching each one of them and kind of thought, Do you know what, it's been pretty entertaining. A solid seven for all of them. And I think it's probably what I'll give this one. So yeah, I really like it. You've got, I'm going to butcher his name, is it Alden, ah, oh, the hell do you pronounce that, Eren, Erenrich? Erenreich? Wish I never even started saying it. But he plays, obviously, uh, Han Solo. He does a decent job. Uh, you've got Woody Harlison, who's in there. Amelia Clark, Donald Glover, um, Fandy Newton. Was she the one who, was it Game of Thrones? Can't quite remember. And Paul Bettany, who plays like the guy, yeah, I've got his name, he's like the villain, a very brief kind of villain towards the end, uh, in charge of that kind of uh, crimson kind of organisation. And um, yeah, so I thought it was decent. I will say that when I put it on, I thought the special effects, and maybe it's because the TV that we've got, which is a good one, by the way, like 4K and all that kind of stuff, I thought, um, I don't know if it's something to do with the television or what, but it, the special effects look quite bad. In particular, the, the, the equivalent of like a land speeder, or maybe it was a land speeder, that Han was in. And I, I don't think it looked particularly good. You could tell that it wasn't real. Now, obviously, it's not real, but you're not meant to think that whilst watching it. It does something about it. It didn't look particularly good. So maybe it was just one scene that they hadn't maybe tidied up, or maybe I'm being extra fussy, I don't know. But that aside, I thought the rest of it was pretty good. I also thought it got off to a really slow start, for me anyway. It was borderline a little bit boring. There was a couple of sort of one-liners, which is just always the way these days with these modern Star Wars movies. I don't know if they're going for a particular kind of demographic, or I don't know if it's because the directors, for the most part, are much younger. That said, this one is Ron Howard, and he's probably in his 60s now, isn't he? Um, so maybe it is more towards the demographic, or representing and reflecting society a little bit more. I don't know, but there's a lot more kind of gags in Star Wars. That said, I guess if you look back at the originals, there's a few kind of funny one-liners there, wasn't there? So maybe I'm being a bit harsh. Maybe it's always been like that. But yeah, I thought it got off to a little bit of a slow start. Borderline boring, but it did get better. And come the end of it, yeah, I really liked it. You know, they've got a few new characters in there, of course. Uh, this one at the back, L3, and you can just about see her. Uh, there she is. And yeah, it was a little bit kind of... A little bit annoying in parts. It kind of had that element, again, which is reflective of social media and society, of that kind of whole, you know, kind of feminism. And not, not that I've got a problem with it, um, but, yeah, it was that kind of social justice warrior kind of element to it. But, again, I don't have that much of a problem with all that. Certainly some people just uh, it makes them absolutely uh, rage uh, with madness. But I'm not that bothered. Whatever. Who cares? Um, but... It is evident, and you do see it happening a lot more and more in these kind of movies. So I could have done without a few of the lines that she said, but a few of them were kind of funny. It was quite touching as well, a scene that kind of happens uh, later on in the movie, which I won't reveal it, but I'm sure you're all aware of it. So I thought there was a lot of nods as well, kind of related to L3 and the Millennium Falcon. Uh, a lot of nods to uh, Han's past, which ties up a lot of loose ends for people, or maybe not even that, maybe you knew it anyway. But it was nice to see it unfold in this uh, standalone movie. Uh, standalone movie, And you can see what happened. You can see, for example, how he got his gun, if you didn't know. Um, so they're around a campfire, and Woody Harlison's character, uh, Beckett, he kind of essentially snaps off, um, for not, what's the word, like a barrel of a gun, and like an extension uh, from his main gun, and that forges uh, a brand new gun in itself, and that's the one that Han uh, goes on to have, and that's the one he has for the rest of Star Wars. So it's a nice little backstory to how his gun started, essentially. Uh, so lots of little nods like that to the past and previous characters. Um, Lando Carizian's in there, which is Donald Glover. Does a really good job uh, at portraying him. And yeah, I just overall thought it was really, really good. It's hard for me to say uh, too much because I don't want to do a Demolition Man job and talk about the plot because I'll just be here for 20 minutes. So instead, all I'll say 
is it didn't disappoint me. I did really like it. It's not amazing, but I did enjoy it. And I, again, I'm going to have to give it a 7 out of 10, which uh, maybe even like a 7.5. There you go. I've gone up an extra half a point. For this segment of what I've been playing, there are two games, and they're both on the PlayStation 3. And the first one is called Spec Ops The Line. Now, this game came out in 2012, so it's not that old in the scheme of things. Spine, obviously. Sometimes the spines are different in the UK or PAL regions, and you might want to see it. So, um, Boxton Complete. Who remembers that line that we always used to say um, for some reason? I love that noise as well. You kind of click it. It's really addictive. I'll do it again. Yeah, so this is weird because when it came out, I played the demo. I can't remember if it was on the 360 or the PS3, but I played the demo and I thought it was all right, but I didn't play beyond the demo. I, in other words, I didn't buy the game. I never got around to playing it. I wanted to, I just forgot about it because there's so many other games out there at the time that I wanted instead. And the years went by and I just ended up forgetting about it. Picked up quite recently, maybe about two months ago. And I really like it, but it's not what I thought it was gonna be. I thought it was just gonna be a straight up generic, like kind of, I was gonna say first person shooter, not really, a kind of cover based shooter. And whilst it kind of is that to a degree, it's very, or it can be reliant on the cover. Um, you kind of need it. You can do without it, but you're more susceptible to damage, of course. So you will need to go and hide behind cover more often than not. So whilst that's a big part of the game, what I kind of downplayed, or not even so much that, what I'd not really um, anticipated was the storyline, which for me is really interesting. Now, I don't want to reveal any major spoilers, but it really made me question what was going on. Let's leave it at that. By the time I'd finished the game, in fact, well before then, probably maybe two or three chapters or levels before I'd got to the end of the game, a few, let's say, strange things started to happen. And it made me wonder, what's going on? This isn't quite the kind of generic, you know, soldiers going into Dubai, which is where it's based, to rescue other people. Uh, it's, that's not quite what's happening. It sort of is, but it isn't. There's a lot of kind of things happening which made me question the whole story and where it's going and it really plays tricks with your mind and it's really clever I really like it so it's not just a generic storyline it starts off that way but the more it progresses it opens itself up and becomes really I find interesting also another really interesting aspect of the game is that it forces you or at least it did with me to question morality you know what is right what is wrong there's a couple of moments in the game or a few moments in the game where you're given a choice as to what you want to do and i don't think there's any negative connotations or side effects of whichever decision you choose it, the game will continue it's not like it's like oh no you chose the bad one there uh, the wrong one you've got to do it again whichever one you choose the same story kind of pans out but it forces you before the story progresses to choose one of these options and sometimes neither one of them is particularly good. So it makes you kind of wrestle with your conscience as to what is right and what is wrong. Connected with that, at least with me, it made me also question war, uh, not that I've never done this before, but also nationalism and patriotism. And because here's the thing, you know, when, when we, and by we, uh, I could be referring to wherever you're from, whether it's the UK, whether it's America or anywhere for that matter, but we've got our uh, national armed forces. And whenever they go to war, they're in a warlike situation across the other side of the world. We're fed the line through patriotism, I guess, more often than not, that, well, they're doing the right thing, you know, and, and we think they are because, you know, we think we're this great democracy, well, which we are kind of in America and the, and the UK and other regions, of course. But we think that when we go to warlike situations, that the other side, whether it's in the Middle East or wherever it is for that matter, we automatically paint them as villains. And okay, sometimes, obviously, sometimes maybe they are. You have to remember that as well. But also sometimes maybe they're not. Maybe we're told they are, but maybe they've done something bad. Uh, but why did they do it? That's the point I'm trying to get at here. Why did they do what they did? Because maybe they did it for legitimate reasons, but we're never really given that information. We're just told a and, and, uh, picture... Uh, is painted and created of somebody, a country, people doing something wrong. And, but why did they do it? Do you know what I mean? It really makes you question like who's right, who's wrong, uh, moral issues and all that kind of stuff and war in general. And that's what that game kind of did with me. It, that's what I took away from it, one of the many things. So it really gets you to think 
and question a lot of things that go on in life and society and in the world and it's quite deep. I will say as well, the last thing I'll say about the game is that at times, I mean of course it's a warlike scenario and a situation so you have to bear that in mind and it is just a game as well of course, it's not real, um, but it can be very kind of graphic and, and dark and gritty and quite violent. Um, you can execute soldiers, by execute I don't mean you know chop their heads off and all that kind of stuff, but they're there on the ground and they're dead or they're dying. You see, you don't have to do anything, but you can um, press a button, I think it's the square button maybe, to, to execute them. So you stand on their faces or you hit them with the gun and all that kind of stuff. It's a little bit of violence and um, I could have done maybe without that, but I don't want to sound like a baby. I know it's just a game, but um, yeah, I, that was, I'm not sure. Maybe it's a little bit too over the top for me. And then also I've just forgot, uh, forgot as well. There's one little feature which I really like in the game. I should say as well, it plays just like a typical kind of cover-based shooter. It's quite tight, it's solid. Uh, getting in and out of cover at times can be a bit of a problem. Um, it's Maybe they've not quite nailed the gameplay there. It's a little bit clunky. Sometimes you want to hide behind cover because the bullets are flying towards you. But because you're not in the, the zone where the game wants you to be, where you can press, I think it's X or whatever it is, because you're not quite there, it doesn't do it. So you've kind of got to move around with the analog stick to move into the exact position that the game has been programmed to make you duck or hide behind cover, and then it will do it. That's kind of frustrating. It would be nice if you could just immediately leap into cover when you press what is the cover button near a cover situation. But it's a bit of a minor quibble, really. Uh, the other thing I'll say, and this is going to be, I think, anyway, uh, the last thing I'll say, is that I really like one of the, the features in the game, which is you can shoot like glass to break the glass, which brings the sand down. So there's a situation right at the start. I'm not sure if it's a set piece where the only option to do is to shoot the glass. I've not tried, I'll have to go back and try just shooting the soldiers, if you can. But there's these soldiers like on top of a bus, very early into the game, so it's, it's not a spoiler. It's one of the first things you do, really. And um, I think there's three soldiers on the top and you can um, shoot the glass and the, the glass will break and the sand will bury them, essentially which is a really nice feature, just something a bit different, isn't it? And there's various points throughout the game where that happens as well. There's another one I can think of where there's a guy, I was a sniper, and I was sniping all these people, and there was one in particular who was next to this broken glass. So again, I'm not sure if you have to shoot the glass, or whether it's just an option uh, to help you, to aid you to killing him, essentially. I chose to shoot the glass, and sure enough, it, it got rid of him. And there was another one where I shot the glass, but it didn't kill anyone, but there was no one there. It was basically destroy the glass to climb up the sand and then that'll help you get out of the building. So it's quite nice, it's something a little bit different and I thought it was good. Oh and I've thought of one more feature, brilliant, before I move on to the next game. Um, another feature is that you can command your squad to shoot at certain targets for you, which I really like. So if there's a lot of enemies on screen then you can select the area that you want them to um, you know, fire at basically and they can take down enemies for you. Sometimes they take bloody ages. Uh, but ultimately, it is, it is a nice little feature. So yeah, Spec Ops The Line, I really like it. And um, you should give it a try because the storyline is interesting. And it's it's weird. It gets a little bit weird. Or it gets a lot weird as the game goes on. And then by the time it's finished, you've got a lot of questions which you want to ask yourself as to what you've just played. Uh, I'll just leave it at that. And then last but not least for this particular segment uh, is another game on the PlayStation 3. This came out in 2009, but I've only just started playing it two weeks ago. In fact, I need another sip before I uh, rant on about this one. Not rant, so I've got nothing bad to say about it. Um, but that game is The Saboteur. Or The Saboteur, Saboteur. This is really good. So I was aware of this game. Like I say, it came out in 2009. So quite a, a relatively early PlayStation 3 game. And also out, of course, on the 360. I love the cover as well. It looks really good. Now, it's basically, I had no idea because I'd never played it. I was aware of the game. I always wanted to play it. It sounded interesting or looked interesting from like some very, very brief gameplay that I'd seen. And uh, But I'd never really seen enough to determine what kind of game it was. I just kind of presumed it was, again, another sort of first-person shooter, that kind of game. But it isn't. It's nothing like that. It's basically Grand Theft Auto set during 1940 in occupied Paris. So nothing like what I thought it was. The map is massive. It really is big. It's just like a Grand Theft Auto game. And I just absolutely love this game. I'm going to call it a sleeper hit 
or a hidden gem, or you can call it whatever you like. Um, similar kind of you know words to that or phrases to that, but it definitely fits in those categories. Not enough people talk about this. I think it's really, really good. I love the art direction. Oh, of course, you need to see that it's uh, boxed and complete. Uh, I love the art direction. You can just about work it out on the back. In fact, I'm not going to show you. I'll put some screenshots up instead. Um, so basically, I think, I can't quite remember, but I think almost all of the game world is start off black and white. Almost all of it. I say black and white. Black and white and grey and very kind of dark and, and it's like rainy. You see the yellow of the lights from the buildings. And the only other colour, I think, which is prominent, is red, which would be on like that, the, the, the bands, the, the patches, the sleeves of the Nazi soldiers and the blood that it makes. You'll see the, um, that kind of splattered around. Uh, but apart from that, it's a very kind of noir effect, uh, which is, look, it looks absolutely stunning. It really does. But then the more you do in different cities, not cities, uh, in suburbs, I guess, of Paris, the more you do, the more good you do, the more you kind of liberate the suburb, the more the world turns colour. And it's a really nice effect. Now, I can't think off the top of my head of another game that has done that. I'm sure it has. I'm not proclaiming this to be the only one. Um, but maybe it is. It's a really, really nice effect. And um, yeah, very, so it's very dark and gritty, rainy. And, and like I say, when all of a sudden you start, and then there's not many people on the streets because they're kind of almost afraid to go out. And, uh, and then it turns into like the sun shining. There's lots of green and the trees and the buildings. And there's lots of people on the streets and they're all talking to you and all that kind of stuff. And it's like you get this kind of like feel good vibe for helping to liberate uh, Paris or suburbs of Paris. So the map is massive, it really is. But what I love about it is that the game is really, really big. Now I am exactly 49% of the way through the campaign. That's a literal stat, I looked at it earlier on. So 49% of the way through the campaign. And I've been playing for around about 22 hours. So the game's clearly big. Now, if you just focus on the main story, apparently it's about 15 hours. But if you do all the side quests, then you're looking at around about 50 odd plus. Hence why I'm halfway through and I've done like 22 hours. So that kind of makes sense. But what I love about it, it's not so much a side quest. These are kind of, uh, kind of extra things you can do on the map. So when you bring up the map, they're all across and they are scattered everywhere. You've got these like white icons. I th they're either circles or they're diamonds. I can't quite remember. And they are absolutely everywhere on the map. And what they signify, each one, is like a Nazi hideout or a sniper typhoon, uh, typhoon, a sniper, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Like a nest, a sniper nest, a watchtower, uh, fuel tanks, basically Nazi uh, installations everywhere. And every single uh, white diamond on the map indicates them and you can destroy them. You don't have to, it's not part of the storyline. This is just extra stuff you can do, but it's so addictive. So you can kind of stock up like in a shop, which is scattered around the maps. And you can stock up on ammunition and buy dynamite and C4 and all that kind of stuff. And you can just go and blow all these things up. And as you blow them up, obviously they disappear off the map. And uh, the stats are there to show you how many you need to do in certain districts of Paris and all that kind of stuff. So you know what you've got to do. Now, initially I thought that might be a bit annoying. I thought, wouldn't it be better if they were hidden off the map and you could just discover them rather than the game telling you where they are? But in actuality, I love how they've done it because the game world is so big, it could be frustrating, you know, constantly going back and forth. So to know, as a matter of fact, where they are is really good. So that in itself, that's not even part of the main storyline. It's nothing to do with it. That can take hours upon hours upon hours. And it's so addictive, just blowing these things up. And every one of them is manned by soldiers, of course. Some there might just be one person there or there might be a big group of them. And you can take them out uh, violently and uh, very noisily, if you like. Or you can do stealth kills. You can use silent pistols and try and kill soldiers so that other ones don't see it. Uh, you can do it that way. If you do get seen, the base alarm goes off and that base alarm can go up to level 5. When that happens, the red icon on the map, or the map starts to flash red. And there's this barrier that you've basically got to run out of. But the higher the base alarm, the more soldiers you're going to attract. And then it starts to bring in like zeppelins and all that kind of stuff. Um, so it can get really hard to, to outdo them. But you can outdo them by running outside of that icon. You can slightly cheat in a way because as soon as, that, as, soon as you've run outside of the icon uh, or the, the red kind of barrier, then the baseline goes off and you can just literally just cross back into that barrier and it's like nothing happened. They don't, they're not looking for you anymore. But it's fine. It's just a game, of course. 
I really like um, how they've done it. it. It it works really really well. I'm trying to think what else there is. There's some really good things in the game. Uh, the AI at times is very questionable, but on other occasions it can be really good and really really hard. And so it's it's a nice kind of balance that they've got there. So there's that to take into consideration when playing it. You can't just go in guns blazing. You will get found out uh, eventually. There's quite a lot of weapons. You can kind of level up and max out on certain perks. That's nice. There's driving in the game. You can obviously get into vehicles. Uh, there's races that you can have. They're like part of the side missions, I guess. I've only done one so far. Um, so that's a, a nice little touch. Uh, there's quite a few bugs. I'm not going to lie. There really are. There's some silly stuff. Like I've blown up like a... Uh, a watchtower and usually you'll see the bloke in it flying out of it which is so satisfying you watch them flying out and then landing on the floor somewhere from like a hundred feet in the air or, or higher and uh, yeah, sometimes a lot higher than that uh, but sometimes very rarely but it has happened they'll get stuck in like mid-air and they'll be lying like 100 150 feet in the air and it's obviously ridiculous it kind of slightly breaks well slightly very much breaks the immersion um but you soon forget about it so yeah, there's probably loads more that I wanted to say about the game, but I really, really like it. I've been very, very pleasantly surprised by this game. It's going to be cheap, I'm sure of that. So if you can um, buy it for you know just a few quid or a few dollars, which you will be able to, and you like the idea of a, a Grand Theft Auto world where you can do what you want, there's, you don't have to do certain things. Uh, well, you do ultimately, eventually, if you want to do the storyline, of course, but you can go off and you can do your own thing. Uh, I really like it. You might want to check it out. It's, I do recommend it. It's really good. So that's the, the Saboteur. 2009 as well. Absolutely ridiculous. So let's move on to the questions. We've got a few questions, then we'll, we'll finish the vid. And uh, first one is from Chris Linney. Thank you, Chris. Do you ever go to flea markets or charity shops in the US? If so, what was your best find? Well, charity shops, of course, it's more like thrift stores over here. Uh, I've not really been to that many, so... My best find isn't even gaming related. It would be music CDs and they weren't rare or anything. Uh, I think I put a tweet out ages ago, maybe it was in the summer, and I picked up probably five or six for like maybe 50 cents each or a dollar each. There were games there, I remember going in and seeing them, but there's some really generic ones for the Wii, for the 360, uh, there might be one or two for the PS3, and they were just rubbish, stuff which was just a waste of time picking up. But the, the rest of the shelves were empty, which may be said to me that someone had got there first and maybe completely cleaned them out of all the games. So, uh, yeah, I don't go very often, to be honest. What we do have a lot here, you've said flea markets, kind of a, it's not really a flea market, of course, um, but what we have a lot of here are yard sales. So people will just put out a sign, uh, they'll get a piece of cardboard, permanent marker, sell a tape it to a street sign, and it'll usually just say, you know, yard sale, big capital letters, it might have the address or it might just have a big arrow like pointing down that street. And then outside that person's house, on the front lawn, front garden, call it what you will, uh, you'll have people who pull out, uh, that put out sorry, a table or two or three or whatever it is. And on those tables are everything they're trying to sell. And so I see them all the time, regularly. Um, not just necessarily during the summer, although clearly that's when it's really popular because of the, you know, the height of summer, of course. Uh, but throughout the course of the year, they're, they're quite popular. So... Um, but I've not been to that many. I see them because I pass them, but I don't go to that many. The last one I went to was years ago. So yeah, Chris, my best finds would have been CDs. Uh, so nothing particularly impressive. One by a band called uh, Keen and another by Lord. Who else? Frankie Goes to Hollywood was one that I picked up. That was like 50 cents. Um, so yeah, it's not rare. It's not massively desirable. Uh, but for 50 cents, I kind of wanted them. So um, yeah, best game find, none yet. Um, eBay, really, is, is where I do all that kind of caper. Thank you, Chris. Shock16, Adam, a couple of questions here. Within your 10 years, 10 years of living in California, are there any American customs you've found yourself falling into? Example, um, eating cheese from a can and thinking baseball is actually a sport worthy of anyone's time. Bracket, controversial, lol, close bracket. It's not controversial, mate. Um, baseball's rubbish. I've been to a professional baseball game. We went to see um, the Oakland Athletics, uh, the A's, I think is what they're called. They're in California. They were playing the Yankees. Now, my family, uh, apart from my um, father-in-law, who's a Giants fan, everybody else on my wife's side, they're all Yankees fans. Uh, the story goes that my uh, wife's granddad uh, on my mother-in-law's side, bloody hell, mouthful, 
Uh, he had trials or whatever the equivalent is for the Yankees, but that's what they say. Um, but well, I'm sure they're not lying. But um, so that was probably one of the reasons why they like the Yankees. Also, I guess they're just a, they're probably the most famous team, aren't they? Um, it, obviously, baseball isn't popular in the UK, and there's not that many countries outside of America where it is. But people, at least they know who the Yankees are. They've heard the name. It's a brand, isn't it? So, uh, so yeah. So we went to see that game and a big stadium. Uh, I was bored, rigid. <laughs> it was really boring. Um, it was too slow. It's too slow for me. Not enough is happening, and I, yeah, I'm just a little bit bored. We've got a local team as well, and they they're just kind of I guess what is it called? Uh, minor league baseball. They act as sort of like a feeder team, if you like, to all the bigger clubs. So you get a lot of players who will start off and they'll be picked up by um, all of the bigger teams in the area. So like the San Francisco Giants and whoever else for that matter. So um, they always win every time. I've seen them a few times, not for a few years, but I've watched a few games. I've never really, if I'm honest, went voluntarily. I've kind of been dragged uh, under duress, kicking and screaming, really. Um, but once I'm there, it's all right to a degree. Um because with minor league, what you get is it's just really small. It's the equivalent, if you like, to non-league football. So it's not these massive stadiums. You know, they've got like seats out and stuff and stands. Uh, when I say seats out, I don't mean like a few deck chairs. They're proper stands. But it's it's much, much smaller on a smaller scale. Like, you know, it's like maybe a couple of thousand as opposed to like, I don't know how many were there when we went to see the Yankees. Probably must be like, the stadium must have been 50, 60,000, if, if not more. But the local team is a lot smaller it's predominantly kind of college kids because there's a big university um, that we've got in town. So a lot of the kids kind of, it, it works both ways. They can study for whatever they're studying, but they also get to play for the team as well. So they get their education. But ultimately, Adam, I'm not into it. So that's one custom which I've not um, got on board with. Not really. Uh, American football, I don't mind because I like rugby. So there's similarities. Uh, but baseball, no. Eating cheese from a can, oddly enough. No, well, I say oddly enough. Maybe it's not that odd. Um, I, I've never done it. It's not really for me. Uh, I've not seen anyone do it, but of course, some some out there do. Definitely not for me. Um, but yeah, what customs? I, I'm not really sure. It, it's hard. Maybe I should have thought of this before I answered the question, but the only real things that I find myself doing is just using certain words because I've lived here, obviously, for 10 years. So certain phrases, certain words that I will substitute. And it's not because I've forgotten what the British one is. It's because if I was to use the British one, I'm going to get a few odd looks. So what's the point intentionally confusing people? It's pointless. So things like, just off the top of my head, um, like if I said pavement, they wouldn't know what I mean for the most part. So I'll say sidewalk. So I'm substituting all these words and phrases every now and again. Um... Yeah, the one thing I've noticed as well is that I've become... I've always been very kind of placid and relaxed and chilled out, but I've become even more chilled out uh, since coming to California. It's a very kind of specifically California thing as opposed to other states. But everyone's very relaxed for the most part anyway. Uh, overly so at times. You know, we've called people up, like professional kind of electricians and people to, to come out and do the garden and all that kind of stuff, uh, or whatever job needs done, you know, like professional people. And they'll, they'll say they're going to come out at like 9 and they turn up at like 11. And there's no apology. It's just like they're so chilled out. It's like as if you don't care. Well, I bloody do care. And I find it really annoying. Sometimes they don't even turn up at all. It's just, but it happens so regularly that it must be something to do with the relaxed way, uh, the relaxed way of life or the lifestyle. It must be. Because it's not just once or twice. The amount of times it's happened where people don't turn up or they're massively late is off the scale. I think it's just the way of life, as I say. Um, so that's that. And then the other thing, the last thing which I'll say to answer the question, it's kind of answering it, but it's not really, is I th I've always been quite, like I said, been very relaxed. I've always been confident and comfortable to talk to people. But being in California for 10 years has made me more... Um, appro not, 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 not approachable. It's made me more um, willing to approach strangers... Uh, or in a shop and strike up a conversation. Something which doesn't really, again, not really happen in the UK, or certainly didn't pre-10 years ago uh, when I was there. It's a very much, again, an American thing where you, people just start talking to strangers. In the UK, if someone does that to you, you think it's weird and you just you think they're a nutcase and you want to walk away from them. In the US, it happens a lot more. A lot more. I've had situations where I've had full-on conversations with people about all sorts in Safeway. 
or in the local grocery store. And I don't know who they are, but we just started talking. And initially, I still find it a bit weird, but you just start to do it. So I've started to do that a lot more. Not so much the talking to random people whilst doing their shopping, but people maybe who are serving me. And yeah, it's just a kind of a way of life. Did I answer that? Maybe just about. Uh, question number two. I was wondering, are there any particular smells that when you get a whiff of, transport you back to a certain time or remind you... Oh, that could be a screen there, maybe back. Or remind you of a memory from growing up. So, ages ago, apologies, I can't remember who it was, but someone did ask me this question. And I said, in my infinite wisdom of broken promises, that I will make a video uh, about certain fragrances and uh, nostalgic memories that I have to each of those fragrances. And I may still do that in the future. It sounds a bit of a weird vid, I, I will admit. But I've just grabbed a small handful here and I'll give you a few brief kind of anecdotes. Um, or not, not even so much anecdotes, just as to what they remind me of. So the first one, there's so many more, it's ridiculous, is XS by uh, Paco Rabanne. And this will mean nothing to you. Let me just smell it. There you go, have a, have a sniff of that. See? It reminds me of... Um, it reminds me of 1995, late 95, obviously, because the Sony PlayStation. And it just reminds me of playing the very early stuff like, smell it again. That's bloody weird, isn't it? I can transport you. It reminds me of like Destruction Derby and uh, Loaded, FIFA 96. I'm gonna need another one. I'm gonna get high here. Oh, it's bloody hell, I like that. So that's what it reminds me of. Uh, next up is, this reminds me, this is um, Ralph Lauren and it's um, Polo, it's called comes in different colours this one's the green one now I got this as like a gift I think from my grandparents back in 93 or 94 so whenever I smell this it reminds me of a certain house it's like I'm transported back to my bedroom and reminds me of the Sega Mega Drive so again have a sniff there we go does it remind you of the Mega Drive this is pointless isn't it oh unbelievable and it reminds me of this thing called play by mail football play by mail this is all before the internet of course so you'd basically, it was like you'd manage a football team, you'd pick your team, you'd buy your players, or you'd put bids in for players, then you'd send it off to this mail order company, they'd do it all for you through a computer, obviously, and then send it back to you, you'd get your games and your results and all that kind of stuff. You'd waste of money. It's like two or three quid every turn. I think that was what it was called, wasn't it? Every game was like a turn. Ridiculous. Oh, bloody hell. Yeah, that's, that's 1994, maybe a little bit of 95. Mental. Uh, next up is this is Davidoff Cool Water. I've started now, so I've got to finish this immature thing. Have a sniff, there we go. Davidoff Cool Water. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> this is unbelievable. This reminds me of, um, if I do that video, I will talk about this in more detail, but it's a bit cringeworthy. This reminds me of stealing when I stole pornographic, hardcore pornographic videos from someone's house. <laughs> that, that does deserve more of an explanation, doesn't it? Bloody hell, I mean, that's, that is so amazing. And that would have been in 1993, 1993. So that reminds me of then. <coughs> and then the last one I'll do, it's quite relevant to this channel, I guess. Uh, much like a couple of the others, to be honest. Um, and it's, uh, it's Tommy Hilfiger. And uh, there you go, have a smell of that. There you go, don't get too high. Oh man, that is so unbelievable. So this reminds me of working in, um, Electronics Boutique in 97, 98 when I worked there. And specifically, it reminds me, I'm transported back. Let's do it again. Let's try and get there. We'll go back. Oh, that is just, that is incredible. That is absolutely incredible. That reminds me, I'm transported right now of being in the stock room upstairs in the pool branch. I worked in the pool branch and then I moved to the Bournemouth branch. The town's right next to each other. I've said that a million times. So there was, you know, the, the distance is probably the same amount between my house, so it didn't make any difference. But it transports me back to specifically the pool branch, and I'm in the stock room and I'm unboxing stuff. And hang on, I need another one to take me back there again. Dangerous, this isn't it? Yeah, I'm unboxing Final Fantasy VII, dozens of them from a big box, and I'm putting them on the shelf. And there's a window in the corner, and you can look out onto the the, like the town square. Unbelievable memories. Unbelievable how it works, isn't it? Like you say, Adam, just smells. It really takes you back. So, yeah, that reminds me of, of the, again, the PS1, 1997 and 1998. Absolutely crazy. There's so many others. I'll have to do a video of it. It's probably going to be boring. I don't know how many of you would even want to watch it, uh, me just telling stories like that. 
bit, bit rubbish, isn't it? But we'll see. And then the other two that I'll mention, well, kind of two, two brands. One is Lynx. Lynx Nevada, Lynx Oriental, Lynx uh, Alaska. All that stuff reminds me of the very early 90s. And uh, I would love to buy those bottles again. I really would. I've actually looked on eBay. And in fact, the other day, I tried to buy... Uh, it's another brand. It's called Insignia Rio, which is what I had for Christmas. You know, they came in them. I don't know if it's still popular these days, but kids, you know, would get uh, stock uh, stocking fillers, isn't it, really? You'd get, like, some deodorant. It'd come in, like, a little box set, maybe a little bit of aftershave, uh, shower gel, you know. And um, and I got an Insignia Rio one in maybe about 91, 1992. And I saw a copy the other day on eBay UK. It's probably there. If you look at it now, the price has been reduced from, like, 30 quid to 20. Uh, and I'm tempted to get it. The thing is, I sent the seller an email who's based in the UK and long story short, it doesn't look like he can send it to America because of the, the flammability, if you like, of putting it on an aeroplane. But I think he will be able to send it via surface mail. So a ship, in other words. Now, obviously, it's going to take a longer time to get here. And then once it does get in here uh, to America, it'll be stuck in customs for about two months because that's what I've had it happen before. And um, so but I, I kind of want it. So just for the sake of grabbing it every now and again, like I say, and just kind of just, just sniffing it and just taking me back to like the early 90s. But I really want to do that. And I really desperately want the Lynx stuff. Lynx Nevada, Alaska and Oriental in particular. But the big problem, the big stumbling block, they can't, it seems, so I've heard. If you know different, please tell me. Uh, but it seems as if you can't put them on, on an aeroplane, which is a crying shame because for someone who's so nostalgic, I would love to have those. I really would. And Lynx Oriental in particular reminds me of a friend of mine called Danny, uh, Danny Woods. And I can picture him, even though I can't smell it, I can still picture the scene of him wearing that big Umbro jacket, a Man United Umbro jacket. And uh, and he, you could just, when he walked by, you'd smell Lynx Oriental. Uh, I used to have it as well, so I, I'm not just, I don't just want to buy it back because it reminds me of him. That'd be a bit weird, wouldn't it? Uh, I used to have the fragrance too. It just reminds me of that era. So there we go, Adam. Um, there's a few fragrances. Thank you very much for the questions. Next up, we've got Snestastic. Thank you, Pete. This video's going to go on a lot longer. Listen, it's pushing Christmas. Whatever. We're going to go back to over an hour, but it is what it is. There are rumours of a discless Xbox One S on the horizon. Thoughts? Yeah, it's just a sign of the times. You talked about this, didn't you, Pete, in your recent vid? And you said um, maybe Microsoft have put it out there as a bit of a, you know, to test the water to see what people think as to whether people really do want, or at least would be willing, to have a digital future. And that's probably what they're doing there. Uh, my thoughts are, to be honest, a digital future for gaming is gonna come. Uh, so yeah, they might as well try it because it's it's an inevitability, quite frankly. Would and you... console, are you playing at this moment in time? I'm, Pete's playing, a lot of PS3. Still finding it difficult to find current gen games I, Pete, wants to play. Yeah, I'm the same, to be honest, Pete. At the start of this generation, I was stocking up on games. We've had a laugh about it. Uh, me and buying sealed Xbox One games. I used to do it I'd, uh, regularly. It got to one point, I must have had about 50 or 60. Mental. It was absolutely ridiculous. The thing is, I think I was on that kind of autopilot from the previous gen, where I was buying and buying and buying and buying and seldom playing. And really, when I look back in hindsight, yeah, I kind of agree with you that, of course, there are some really good games this generation, obviously, um, but there's not that many. Not really. Not when you take into effect and consideration that the PS5, PS5, the PS4 and the Xbox One came out in 2013. You know, admittedly, late 2013. But nonetheless, it's five years. And there's not that much out. Not really. So, I kind of agree with you there. But I do still like it. And we're starting now to see a lot of really, really good games. But we tend to see that, don't we, really, at the end of every generation. All the good games, or not all the good games, but many good games come out. So Last of Us 2 is due out. Uh, Red Dead Redemption, of course. Or Red Dead Redemption 2 has just recently come out. I've not played in that for absolutely ages uh, because I've been playing other games. As I say, I'll talk about that in the next vid. Uh, but it's brilliant. I just haven't had the spare time. But I'll agree with you, Pete. For me, I'm also playing a lot of PlayStation 3. Uh, I'm really into it, as I've explained earlier on, with the Saboteur, which I'm playing and loving, and uh, and Spec Ops, which I really enjoyed. There's many, many more as well. The thing is, with the PS3 for me, I've got around about um, 125, there or thereabouts, PlayStation 3 games. And 
because I stocked up on them so much last generation, there's many that I still haven't played. So I'm really enjoying going back to them and, uh, and putting them on and experiencing them, in many cases, for the first time. And yeah, it's still a little bit, for me, a little bit jarring to go back to the PlayStation 3, even something, something as recent as the PS3. Because, I mean, even with the Saboteur, I didn't touch upon it before, but when I first put it on, graphically, I wasn't impressed. I was immediately struck by like the jagged edges, and it was like, oh, Christ, I'm not really sure about this. Uh, which sounds a bit snobbish, doesn't it? Um, but you can't help what you see, and because you get spoiled by current technology. You know, for all those people out there, and there are still some of them, who say, oh, there's not much of a leap between the PS3 and the PS4. Are you sure about that? That There's a massive leap between the two. There really is. Um, I mean, admittedly, you know, this is an early game. It's 2009. So when you look at a, a latter PS3 title, yeah, the, the gap is bridged, to be fair. The gap is definitely bridged. But there's still, there's still a difference. There really is. You only really witness it once you're playing it for yourself for prolonged periods of time, and especially like on a 4K TV, you know, then you really, really, you really do see the differences. So, um, but yeah, I'm really liking the PlayStation 3P. Uh, I felt like I was gonna say something else there, but I kind of distracted myself and I've lost the plot. So PS3 for me as well, at least at this moment in time. Question number four, have you seen, or oh, sorry, have you heard about the new Mary Poppins film? Have you watched the trailer? Looks pretty good. I had heard about it, I'd forgotten all about it, but just before I made this vid, I watched the trailer. I agree, it looks really good. I looked very briefly on Wikipedia, uh, never lies, obviously, and I, and I mean very briefly, just kind of skipped through it uh, to kind of look at the plot and all that kind of stuff. Because I was wondering, what is it? Is it a reboot? Is it a, a remake? Are they, is it almost like the first one didn't take place? Or is it a sequel of sorts? And yeah, it looks like it's a bit of a sequel, doesn't it, really? A slight reimagining, in a way, but a sequel as well because it involves the Banks family. The kids are now grown up and they've got the kids of their own. I think that's what it is, isn't it? So yeah, it looks really interesting. You've obviously got Ben Whishaw uh, in there. Now Ben Whishaw was in a very English scandal, which I talked about on a previous vlog, a previous brew with Hugh Grant. If you've not seen it, it's amazing. It's absolutely brilliant. I loved it. You've got to watch it. A very English scandal, Netflix, check it out. So anyway, he was in that and he was pretty good. And, um, and Emily Blunt, who of course is playing uh, Mary Poppins. Now, the one thing I'll say from watching the trailer is I thought it was a bit of a missed opportunity because in the original Mary Poppins, you've got Julie Andrews, of course, and she looks in the mirror in one of the scenes and then she walks off and her reflection kind of remains. It's almost like she's still there. It's like two Mary Poppins for the price of one. And in the trailer, or at least one of the trailers, if there's been many, the one that I watched, You've got Emily Blunt playing Mary Poppins, as I say. She looks into the mirror, does a little bit of a talk, and then walks away, and then the reflection stays there, and then that starts to talk. Now, I think it would have been really nice, a really nice touch, if when Emily Blunt walked away, Julie Andrews' reflection was there. That would have been a really good touch. I'm surprised I didn't think about that, because think about it, doesn't that sound good? Seriously, who else has thought of that? Maybe that's, I'm the only person on the planet who thought of that, but... Um, that would have been good. Now, apparently, Julie Andrews was asked if she wanted to have a cameo in the movie. And initially, she said no, because she didn't want to take it away from Emily Blunt. This is kind of her moment now. And uh, and then she said, oh, well, maybe I might do a cameo. Uh, but then she changed her mind again. So it's not like the director didn't try. They did. All the people involved, they tried to get her involved. So you can't blame them. She just didn't want to do it. Um, not negatively. It's not because she didn't want to be involved with the movie or she thought it was rubbish. She just, she's kind of had her time and she wants someone else to kind of take the glory. But it looks interesting with all like the 2D effects from, again, just from the trailer. I like the art direction. It almost looks, well, it obviously looks like it's a modern movie, but it looks very old fashioned as well in what they're wearing and all that kind of stuff. Uh, Dick Van Dyke's back in it. Um, you know, again, a cameo of sorts. Nice little role that he's kind of sort of reprising in a, in a way. Uh, yes, we will watch that for certain, and I, I agree, it looks really good. Uh, so thank you very much, Pete. Next questions are from Lisa Loves. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, question number one, is there any food, drinks, or confectionery you really miss from the UK? Yes, there is, because I am a greedy get. So you name it, I'll probably miss it. But here's the thing, a couple of things. One, the world is a small place these days, so you can just import food quite easily. But also, there's a shop, and I may have touched upon this in the past, uh, maybe not, not sure. 
but it's only 15 minutes or so from me. And it's just a standard grocery store, that's all it is. It sells all sorts of the usual stuff. But there's an import section, <coughs> excuse me. And in that import section, they've got like the British section, of course, and one or two others, but it's predominantly British. And so I've seen things like Iron Brew. I bought some of that quite recently. <coughs> I need another cough and a drink, I think. Or I need some Iron Brew. Maybe that was a sign. So yeah, um, I've seen and bought and therefore had Iron Brew, Fruit Pastels, uh, Mint Aero. What else have they had? Dolly Mixtures, uh, Sherbet Lemons. Uh, they had, what else did I buy? Uh, baked Beans, Heinz Baked Beans and... Um, Salad cream. Of course, I miss all the usual stuff. Um, you know, uh, trying to think. salt and vinegar discos. Salt and vinegar discos. Love them like a brother. Pickled onion monster munch. Um, what's some fish and chips? Is it Burton's fish and chips? I love those. A friend of mine sent me some of those, actually. Um, when did she do that? Claire. That was like last year or the year before. And um, she sent me like a big box of them, basically. And, and they went. Of course they did. The old belly. They went within about an hour. And when she asked, she asked me like, this is, I didn't understand it. She asked me like a week later, she went, do you have any left? And I was like, of course I don't. And she was shocked. And I thought, Christ, well, I bet that was after a week. So I daren't tell her that they'd gone after a day. She'd think I was right, greedy bugger, well, which I am. So yeah, Lisa, I miss a lot, but I can get some of it here. Um, and if not, I guess I can just order it. It's not really a big deal. Um, and really at the end of the day, you know, I've, my, my palate now has developed, unfortunately, uh, a taste for American chocolate to the point where I can't really tell the difference. When I did get here, I could tell a difference between, say, um, a British uh, Twix and an American Twix. It was immediately obvious, uh, obvious when that thing went in my mouth. It's like, whoa, this is, it's like really sugary. And it was just like, it didn't quite taste right. There was less emphasis on chocolate and more on like the, the sugar. And I didn't really like it. Whereas now, after a decade, it, I've just got used to it. Um, which is probably not a good thing, really. So, um, But anyway, 1st of January, diet starts. We'll see. Question number two. What is the most embarrassing thing you've done in the last year? <laughs> Lisa, I do embarrassing things on a daily basis. So, I, honestly, there's so many. This isn't a great example. Uh, if you've watched my vlog... Well, I know you've watched a few in the past. But if you've watched... Uh, if you go back and watch other vids, I regularly kind of talk about stupid stuff. But... Um, I'll use this as an example. It's not the best one, but it just happened the other day. So, well, about a week or two ago. So it's kind of fresh in the mind. So I was in the kitchen and depending on what angle you're at, uh, if you knock on the door, you can see into it and you can see me standing there. So I was cleaning the dishes. I put the dishes away and I heard the knock on the door and they saw me. So it's not like I could have pretended I wasn't in. I couldn't have froze and pretended I was a statue. I couldn't have ran away. Well, I guess I could have done both of those things, but that would have been weird. So I went to the door, opened it, and it was a, a little old woman. Um, but being patronised or condescending, she was an old woman and she was little. And so uh, I opened the door, and in her hand she had a, a leaflet, because it was like the midterm election. So like I said, go back a couple of weeks or whenever it was. And um, she was obviously uh, like canvassing for the local person to, who wanted to be elected, I guess. And um, she had it in her hand, and she went, oh, hi, I'm just here on behalf of whatever name she gave out. I can't remember the name. And uh, and she kind of not she in her hand she had the leaflet which obviously she was going to give me but she wasn't quite ready to give it to me she was clearly giving it the spiel and then she was going to hand it to me but I just took it straight out of her hand smiled and went oh thank you very much I'll give that a read later see ya and that, and that was it and her face kind of dropped she wasn't expecting you know for me to say that and she went oh well thank you see ya have a nice day and all the rest of it she obviously wanted like I say to sell her to me as it were and tell me why I should be voting. So her hand was still in the air and I just swiped it out. Not violently, but I just kind of just smiled when I did it. I kind of went, oh, thank you very much. Have a nice day. I'll give her a read later. Unbelievable. I just shut the door and that was it. And then just watched her kind of like, you know, toddle off down the drive. And I didn't even think at the time. But when my wife got back, I, you know, I just told her. I went, oh, someone knocked before. I think maybe I'd left the leaflet on like the table. And she went, what's this? And I went, oh, someone knocked on the door. And I just swiped it out of their hands and that was that. And my wife was like, what? So I recited that story that I've just told you. And she's like, oh, that sounds pretty rude. I mean, she laughed about it. And I was like, I, I guess it is, isn't it? I didn't mean it to be. So, yeah, that was rude. It was inadvertently. Um, and it was embarrassing, albeit in hindsight. Um, but there we are. But it's just me. I always do these things. But honestly, I, I do them all the time. It's nothing new with me. Uh, it's ridiculous. 
Question number three. What is the scariest movie that you actually enjoy? Bit of a now, background for... story there. Lisa likes uh, scary movies, which is why she's asking me, and I don't really like them. But I here's the thing. I don't really like... What I don't like, I can maybe once and for all, instead of in text, I can tell you. What I don't like are overly overly gory movies where violence is done just for the sake of it. I just don't like it at all. I don't get anything from it. I don't like watching it. It's not my thing. But what I do like are horror movies that rely a lot on suspense. Maybe the odd jump here and there. I don't mind that. But I love the suspense factor. So to directly answer your question, for me, the one that I can at least think of, and I've always thought this, the scariest movie that I can think of, that I enjoy watching, although it's not like I watch it regularly, uh, but whenever it's on and I'm, I'm watching it, would be the original Halloween from 1978. All right, it's 1978, it's aged a little bit, um, but I find it really scary still. It, it's not. It's got a little bit of gore in there, a very tiny amount really, but it's more the suspense and the several scenes in that which are really creepy, directed really good by John Carpenter, directed really good. Uh, more good than that sentence. Directed really well, I guess. Um, so, yeah, I, I really like that's the answer I'll give. I've not seen the more recent one. I, I probably will watch it soon, I think. It looks pretty interesting. Hopefully, it relies more on shock and suspense than gore. That's what I'd like. And if it does, I'll definitely watch it. If there's more of an emphasis on gore for the sake of it, I, I might skip it, at least for a while. The original Halloween. Absolutely brilliant. Thank you very much. And then question number four: When do you put your Christmas? Uh, when do you put up your Christmas decorations? Mine, Lisa's, went up on November the twenty-fourth. Unacceptable. Slightly more acceptable than Natalie, who put it up on uh, November the first, <laughs> which was absolutely opposite. Did I mention that before? I think I did. Natalie on Twitter. I, I think I did mention that. If not, well, I've just said it there. Um, yeah, November the first is, is insane. November the twenty-fourth. Uh, a little bit early, to be honest. Um, but I'll let it slide, whatever. Uh, for me, we just put, these. the funny thing, we put the tree up yesterday, uh, late yesterday night, but we've not yet put the decorations up, so I guess we'll do that tomorrow, uh, or, or maybe later, um, or maybe tonight or tomorrow, or whenever, obviously very, very soon, otherwise it's just going to be a bare tree, and that'll be a bit rubbish. And we may put one up in the front as well, so uh, you can see right, right next to the front door. We might do that, because we've got a tree left over from a few years ago. So I might as well use it. Obviously a fake one. <laughs> if it was a real tree from a few years ago, it'd have like three pines on. Worst tree ever. So, so yeah, thank you very much, Lisa. And last but not least, four, five questions from LFC Gamer. What is your favourite PS1 launch title? Well, if we're talking about launch titles that I owned, I'm going to say Loaded. I've got it. I'll put a picture of it on the screen. Um, yeah, I love it. I think the lighting is amazing. Still, even today, looks really, really good. And I like the gameplay. It can be a bit tricky in parts, a little bit clunky, a little bit clumsy, but overall, I really like it. Um, I think Ridge Racer, wasn't that also a, a launch game? But I didn't get that until early 96. I'm guessing maybe with some like Christmas money or something. Um, so, yes, I'd say loaded. For that. Question number two. Apart from Main Road, are there any other football stadiums that have sadly been demolished you wish were still standing? Yeah, Main Road is Manchester City's old football stadium. Uh, which, as LFC Gamer points out, was demolished back in 2000 and... Oh God, three? It's 2003, I think. Um, and it's a, an incredibly nostalgic stadium to me. And I won't lie, I was quite upset about it. I know it's just football. I was quite upset about it for quite a few years. But what makes me not miss it as much, anywhere near as much, is the fact that City won the title, obviously, in spectacular fashion in 2013 so like within 10 years basically that stadium the etihad the blue camp <laughs> the um the city of manchester stadium comms call it what you will that stadium now has its own history and it got it almost straight away which really helps it really helped me anyway so now when i look back I, I yeah i miss main road of course i do but i don't miss it as much because as i say the new stadium already has its history and not every team can guarantee that. So uh, I think that's that's a massive, massive factor for me. And uh, one which makes me miss it less. Other stadiums, well, the other team that it means a lot to me, of course, is AFC Bournemouth. I've been moved down there, uh, moved down to Bournemouth when I was nine, there or thereabouts. Uh, nine or ten or whatever it was. And, um, well, the thing is with Dean Court, 
the old stadium when I used to go and watch them and when I was ball boy and all that kind of stuff, that, that stadium is kind of still there, but the pitch used to go from like, was it east to west? But they've rotated the stands and the pitch, so it now goes from north to south. It's still in the same place, essentially, kind of. Um, you know, you still go down the same roads, you still go into the same park, King's Park. It's still there. They've just slightly moved it about a bit. It's not like the other side of town or anything like that. And then the new stadium that Bournemouth are talking about building, because they didn't expect to be in the Premier League, you know, eight, nine, ten years ago. And they clearly do need a bigger stadium. The new stadium they want is still going to be pretty much on the same place, of the same plot of land, a little bit further up, still in King's Park, so a big park, essentially. And so, um, but yeah, maybe like an extra thousand feet away or whatever from where it currently is. But it's essentially still in the same place. The Dell, Southampton, that would be another one. We went through a spell where we used to go and watch a lot of, or a fair bit, of Southampton playing the Premier League, just because it was the nearest Premier League to me, uh, team to me at the time, Southampton being around about 40 minutes from Bournemouth. So, and obviously the Dell's not there anymore. That was a really small, quaint ground. And, um, yeah, it was really nice going to that, but it was very old-fashioned, and they kind of did need a new one, really. So, thank you very much. Question number three. Which video games made you rage with anger as a kid? Here's the funny thing. I can't really think of any that made me rage as a kid, but I can think of many which have made me rage as an adult. What kind of logic is that? It should be the other way around, really. Um, Call of Duty, going back five, six, seven years ago. Oh, my God. I turned the air blue with uh, some of the words. I, I couldn't even repeat them. You think of the word, and I mean you think of it, and I'd have said it several times over. It would stress me out something chronic. And even if I go on it now, which is very rare, but I can I, I bubble up a little bit and I can, I can tell I'm getting there and the odd word will slip out. I just, no, I can't do it. But that's a funny thing, isn't it? With old games, they were harder, but you, well, at least I didn't get as angry. Yes, I got frustrated, but I didn't get as angry back then as I did or as I do as an adult. It's kind of strange. Question number four. What is your favourite Amiga game soundtrack of all time? Stuff like Zool, Jaguar XJ220 and Xenon 2 have godlike tunes, in my opinion, in his opinion. But I agree. Yeah, this is a really good idea for a video, actually. which One which I thought of doing ages ago. Like a top 10, top 20 Amiga uh, list, which I may do in the future. Here we go again, Broken Promises. Uh, but I, I might do that in the future. But yeah, you've named some good ones there. Off the top of my head, like Gods is brilliant. I love Gods. Uh, Magic Pockets, that was really good. I like that. Um, Harlequin is amazing. Check out Harlequin. It's so good. It goes on for ages. Uh, First Samurai is excellent. Did a gameplay of that years ago. Check it out if you're bored. Um, Leander, was Leander quite a good theme tune? I can't remember. Um, not sure, but those, yeah, those spring to mind. What else? I'm trying to think, looking over, they've got a few ST and Amiga games over there. Um, they're not really memorable. <laughs> That video kid's not particularly good or great, but I'm looking at that game. Agony, that's a good one. Uh, that's a really good tune. Um, oh, God, mine's gone blank. Monkey Island's a classic. There's so many. But maybe a video in the future's a, a good idea, which you've just kind of given me, which I already had, but you've just reminded me. Might do that in the future. Last but not least, question number five. Can you remember the first album you ever bought with your own pocket money? Well, I can. Here's the thing, a little bit of a backstory first. When I was a kid... I used to have records and stuff bought for me and cassettes. Uh, if I really wanted it, then I'd kind of ask my dad. My mum likes music, of course, but my dad's... Music's his thing. He's never been into football. Music is his thing. And um, so if I wanted a, a record or a cassette or something, he'd get it. But when I look back in hindsight, he probably didn't get it just because I wanted it. He probably only ever bought it when I wanted it, but when he wanted it too. Good thinking. Saved himself a few quid there. So, um, <laughs> yeah... I I think, oh, before I, t well, not I think, I know what the answer is. There's a couple of tapes, again, I didn't buy it with my own money, but I wanted them and I asked for them. So I was a little bit older at this point, but I was still a kid, like 1989, I think it was. So I was like 10 or 11, and I got the London Boys, the 12, is it the 12 or the 10 Commandments to Dance? Oh, what is it? I can't even remember. Let's go 50-50, the 12 Commandments to Dance. Wait and see, it's probably going to be 10 now. I think it's a 12 Commandments dance. And I love that album. It's a great, it's cheesy, of course it is, but it's a great dance record. Every track is brilliant. I asked for that and I got that. And then the following year, I think it was 1990, it could have been 91, I asked for New Kids on the Block, Hanging Tough, and I got that one. It was all a rage. Come on, give me a break. 
so I got that. But the first one I bought myself with my own money, I had others as well that I borrowed from friends, Guns N' Roses, Usual Illusion 1 and 2, um, springs to mind. The first one I vividly remember buying myself, and it's a good one, and it's Nirvana, never mind. I bought it on cassette, I bought it from Our Price Records in um, in Bournemouth, or was it Poole or Bournemouth, one of the two, and I, uh, I remember like it was yesterday, I was wearing a black and yellow flannel shirt, very grunge-like, I was 13 I imagine, and uh, I wasn't very tall at 13 years of age, I, even now I'm only about 5, nah, maybe 5'10", five, 5'9", ten. Five, five, ten, something like that, it's a kind of average height really. Um, but I, even then I was quite a late grower. So back then I would have been very small at the age of like 13 because I remember struggling to reach like the bloody counter and the guy above it who seemed like really old at the time, he was probably 23. But you know, when you're 13, like someone who's 18 seems like they're 86. So I remember him looking down at me. That was the first thing I remember, just towering above me. And also I remember like it was yesterday, the look he was giving me as if to say, you're too young and too small to be buying Nirvana, never mind. But obviously there wasn't an age restriction on it. So I just remember him taking it off me, like me handing it to him, him taking it, looking at me, kind of feeling weird, too young for this, and then just putting it through the till and saying, you know, 9.99 please, or whatever it was, handing him the money. I remember him putting it in the, into the bag, the Alprice bag. I remember so clearly taking that off him and walking out and, uh, and ultimately um, taking it home and playing it and loving it. So yeah, my flirtation with grunge was very, very brief really. That was would have been, that came out in 91, but I think it could have been early 92 when I bought it. Um, sometime around about early 92. It'd been out a while, uh, but it was on cassette. So um, obviously it would have been around about 91, 92, because after that I, I moved on to CDs. So anyway, thank you very much for the questions to uh, LFC Gamer, to Pete Snestastic, Lisa Loves, Adam Shock 16 and Chris Linney. Thank you. If you have any questions for... Here's the thing. I might do a Christmas special next week. Or it might be the week after. You never know with me, do you? Um, but if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to ask. Um, no pressure. Obviously, if you don't, I'm not going to put your little your name into a little book. And you didn't ask me any questions. I understand. Not everyone wants to. I don't always do it when people have their question uh, vids. I just like to watch it and listen to what other people have asked. So, uh, But if you have any, please feel free to ask me. And I'll be back soon. So that may be next Friday. It may be the one after. We'll have to wait and see. I plan on making that pickup stroke gameplay vid within the next few days. Maybe by early mid next week, I'll have that up. Uh, please feel free to give it a watch uh, if you want, if you're bored. Or maybe you're going to be playing catch up over the Christmas, festive New Year period, and you might want to go back to it. So I'll leave it up to you. Uh, thank you very much for watching. And until that next vid, see you later.